It is impossible to understand the witch cult without first understanding the position of the chief personage of that cult. He was known to the contemporary Christian judges and recorders as the devil and was called by them Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the foul fiend, the enemy of salvation and similar names appropriate to the principle of evil, the devil of the scriptures with whom they identified him. This was far from the view of the witches themselves. To them, this so-called devil was God, manifest and incarnate. They adored him on their knees, they addressed their prayers to him, they offered thanks to him as the giver of food and the necessities of life. They dedicated their children to him and there are indications that, like many another god, he was sacrificed for the good of his people. The contemporary writers state in so many words that the witches believed in the divinity of their master. Danaeus, writing in 1575, says, The devil commandeth them that they shall acknowledge him for their God, call upon him, pray to him, and trust in him. Then do they all repeat the oath which they have given unto him, in acknowledging him to be their God. Gaul, in 1646, nearly a century later, says that the witches vow to take him, the devil, for their god, worship, invoke, obey him. The witches are even more explicit and their evidence proves the belief that their master was to them their god. The accusation against Marion Grant of Aberdeen in 1596 was that the devil, whom thou callest thy god, causeth thee worship him on thy knees as thy lord. Delancre in 1609 records, as did all the inquisitors, the actual words of the witches when they presented a young child. They fell on their knees and said, Grand Seigneur, lequel j'adore. And when the child was old enough to join the society, she made her vow. The Lancashire witch Margaret Johnson in 1633 said there appeared unto her a spirit or devil in the similitude and proportion of a man and the said devil or spirit bid her call him by the name of Mamillion, and saith that in all her talk and conference she calleth her said devil Mamillion my god. According to Madame Bourignon in 1661, persons who were thus engaged to the devil by a precise contract will allow no other god but him. Isabel Gaudi confessed that he made us believe that there was no God beside him. We get all this power from the devil and when we seek it from him, we call him our Lord. At each time when we would meet with him, we behoove it to rise and make our curtsy and we would say, Ye are welcome, our Lord, and how do ye, my Lord? The Yorkshire witch Alice Hewson in 1664 stated that the devil appeared like a black man upon a black horse with cloven feet and then I fell down and did worship him upon my knees. Anne Armstrong in Northumberland 1673 gave a good deal of information about her fellow witches. The said Anne Bates have several times danced with the devil at the places aforesaid, calling him sometimes her protector and other sometimes her blessed saviour. At Crichton, 1678, the devil himself preached to the witches and most blasphemously mocked them if they offered to trust in God who left them miserable in the world. And neither he nor his son Jesus Christ ever appeared to them when they called on them, as he had, who would not cheat them. Even in America, 1692, Mary Osgood, the wife of Captain Osgood, declared that the devil told her he was her God and that she should serve and worship him. Prayers were addressed to the master by his followers and in some instances the prayer was taught by him. 
Alice Goodridge of Stapen Hill in Derbyshire, 1597, herself a witch and the daughter of a witch, was charged by Sir Humphrey Ferrers with witchcraft about one Michael's cow, which cow, when she brake all things that they tied her in, ran to this Alice Goodridge her house, scraping at the walls and windows to have come in. Her old mother Elizabeth Wright took upon her to help, upon condition that she might have a penny to bestow upon on her god and so she came to the man's house kneeled down before the cow crossed her with a stick in the forehead and prayed to her god since which time the cow continued well elizabeth sawyer the witch of edmonton 1621 was taught by the devil he asked of me to whom i prayed and i answered him to jesus christ and he char he charged me then to pray no more to Jesus Christ, but to him the devil. And he, the devil, taught me this prayer. Sancti Becator, nomum tuum, Amen. The Queen of Elfin, or Elfame, is sometimes called the devil, and it is often impossible to distinguish between her and the devil when the latter appears as a woman. Whether she was the same as the French Reine de Saba, is equally difficult to determine. The greater part of the evidence regarding the woman devil is from Scotland. In 1576, Bessie Dunlop's evidence shows that Tom Reed, who was to her what the devil was to witches, was under the orders of the Queen of Elfame. That and stout woman come in to her and sat down on the form beside her and asked her and drink at her, and she gave her were also told her that that barn would die and that her husband should mend of his sickness. The said Bessie answer it that she remember it well thereof and Tom said that was the Queen of El Fame, his mistress, where had commanded him to wait upon her and to do her good. The devil thy master come to thy mother's house in the likeness and shape of a woman, whom thou callest the queen of Elfin, and was deliverate of a barn, as appear it to the there, thou confess, that be the space of thirty two years since, or thereby, thou begud to have carnal deal with that devilish spirit, the queen of Elfin, thou affirmest that the queen of Elfin has a grip of all the craft. In many religions, the disguising of the principal personage, whether god or priest, as an animal is well known. The custom is very ancient. Such disguised human beings are found even among the Paleolithic drawings in France and on a slate palette belonging to the late pre-dynastic period of Egypt. There is representation of a man disguised as a jackal and playing on a pipe. The ritual disguise as an animal is condemned with great particularity as devilish in the Liber Poenitentialis of Theodore of the 7th century, showing that it continued in force after the conversion of England to an outward appearance of Christianity. From the analogy of other religions in which this custom occurs, it would appear that it is a ritual for the promotion of fertility, the animal represented being either the sacred animal of the tribe or the creature most used for food. The animal forms in which the devil most commonly appeared were bull, cat, dog, goat, horse and sheep. A few curious facts come to light. On tabulating these forms, the devil appears as a goat or a sheep in France only. He is never found in any country as a hare, though this was the traditional form for a witch to assume, nor is he found as a toad, though this was a common form for the familiar. The fox and the ass also are unknown forms, and in Western Europe the pig is an animal almost entirely absent from all the rites and ceremonies as well as from the disguises of the devil. In the ceremonies for admission, as in all the other ceremonies of the cult, the essentials are the same in every community and country, though the details differ. The two points which are the essence of the ceremony are invariable. 
The first, that the candidates must join of their own free will and without compulsion. The second, that they devote themselves body and soul to the master and his service. The ceremonies of admission differed also according to whether the candidate were a child or an adult. The novice was marked by a scratch from a sharp instrument, but was not admitted to the high mysteries till about the age of 20. As no further ceremonies are mentioned, it may be concluded that the initiation into these mysteries was performed by degrees and without any special rites. At Lille, about the middle of the 17th century, Madame Borignon founded a home for girls of the lowest classes. After a few years, in 1661, she discovered that 32 of these girls were worshippers of the devil and in the habit of going to the witches' sabbaths. They had all contracted this mischief before they came into the house. One of these girls, named Bella, aged 15, said that her mother had taken her with her when she was very young and had even carried her in her arms to the witches' sabbaths. Another girl of 12 had been in the habit of going to the sabbath since she was also very young. As the girls seemed to have been genuinely fond of Madame Borignon, she obtained a considerable amount of information from them. They told her that all worshippers of the devil are constrained to offer him their children. When a child thus offered to the devil by its parents comes to the use of reason, the devil then demands its soul and makes it deny God and renounce baptism and all relating to the faith, promising homage and fealty to the devil in manner of a marriage, and instead of a ring the devil gives them a mark with an iron awl in some part of the body. It is also clear that Marguerite Montvoisin in Paris had been instructed in witchcraft from an early age, but as the trial in which she figures was for the attempted poisoning of the king and not for witchcraft, no ceremonies of initiation or admission are recorded. In Great Britain, the ceremonies for the reception of children are not given in any detail, though it was generally acknowledged that the witches dedicated their children to the devil as soon as born, and from the evidence, it appears that in many cases the witches had belonged to that religion all their lives. The Anderson children in Renfrewshire were all admitted to the society at an early age. Elizabeth Anderson was only seven when she was first asked to swear fealty to the black grim man. At Forfar in 1661, Jonat Howard was so young that when Isabel Siri presented her to the devil, the devil said, What shall I do with such a little bairn as she? He accepted her, however, and she was evidently the pet of the community, the devil calling her his bonny bird. At Paisley, Annabel Stewart was 14 when at her mother's persuasion she took the vows of fidelity to the devil. Elizabeth Frances at Chelmsford, tried in 1556, was about 12 years old when her grandmother first taught her the art of witchcraft. Elizabeth Demdike, the famous Lancashire witch, brought up her own children, instructed her grandchildren and took great care and pains to bring them to be witches. In Sweden, the children were taken regularly to the assemblies, and in America, also a child witch is recorded in the person of Sarah Carrier, aged eight, who had made her vows two years before at her mother's instigation. The ceremony for the admission of adults who were converts to the witch religion from Christianity follow certain main lines. These are one, the free consent of the candidate, two, the explicit denial and rejection of a previous religion, and three, the absolute and entire dedication of body and soul to the service and commands of the new master and God. The ceremony is being more startling and dramatic for adults than for children. They are recorded in Great Britain with the same careful detail as in France, and it is possible to trace the local variations, although in England, as is usual, the ceremonies had lost their significance to a far greater extent than in Scotland, and are described more shortly, probably because they were more curtailed. 
and the solemnity confessed by our witches is the putting one hand to the crown of the head and another to the sole of the foot, renouncing their baptism in that posture. Del Rio tells us that the devil useth to baptise them of new and to wipe off their brow the old baptism, and our witches confess always the giving them new names. The devil's mark useth to be a great article with us, but it is not per se found relevant except it to be confessed by them, that they got the mark with their own consent. The general order of the ceremony of admission can be gathered from the evidence given at the trials, though no one trial gives the order in its entirety. The ceremony might take place privately, at a local meeting, or in full Sabbath. It was the same for either sex, except that the men were not usually introduced. The women were sometimes introduced, sometimes not. If there were any sort of introduction, it was by someone who was acquainted with the candidate, usually the person who had induced her to join. She was brought before the devil, who asked her if she would be his faithful servant, and if she would renounce her previous religion and dedicate herself to his service, taking him as her god. After the renunciation and vows, the devil baptised her in his own great name, and among the Scotch witches gave her a new name by which she was known there afterwards. It is not clear whether the introduction of a candidate by a member of the society was an early or a late detail. It is quite possible that it was early, the introducer standing in the same relation to the candidate as the Christian sponsors stand to a candidate for baptism. On the other hand, it is quite comprehensible that, when the witch religion became an object of persecution, no new member could be admitted unless vouched for by some trustworthy person. The renunciation of previous errors of faith and the vows of fidelity to the new belief are part of the ceremony of admission of any convert to a new religion. The renunciation by the witches was explicit, but the records are apt to pass it over in a few words, e.g. I denied my baptism, I forsook God and Christ. The vows to the new God were as explicit as the renunciation of the old. Danaeus says, he commanded them to forswear God, their creator, and all his power, promising perpetually to obey and worship him, who there standeth in their presence. The English witches merely took the vow of fealty and obedience, devoting themselves body and soul to him. Sometimes only the soul, however, is mentioned, but the Scotch witches of both sexes laid one hand on the crown of the head the other on the sole of the foot, and dedicated all that was between the two hands to the service of the master. The witch's mark, or devil's mark, as it is indifferently called, is one of the most important points in the identification of a witch, as the infliction of it was often the final rite in the admission ceremonies. The fact that any person bore such a mark was taken as incontrovertible proof that the bearer was a witch. There were two kinds of marks which should be carefully differentiated, one of which was clearly natural, the other probably artificial. Both were said to be insensible to pain and not to bleed when pricked or pierced. The mark proper appears to have been the coloured spot or design which followed the infliction of a prick or nip by the claws or teeth of the devil on the person of the neophyte. The red mark is described as being like a flea bite small and circular. The blue mark seems to have been larger and more elaborate, apparently in some kind of design. From the evidence, five facts are clear, that the mark was coloured, that it was permanent, that it was caused by the pricking or tearing of the skin, that the operator passed his hand or fingers over the place, and that the pain could be severe and might last a considerable time. Put together in this way, the facts suggest tattooing.